What in the world have I built for my bees this time? Stay tuned, you'll find out. <laughs> Hi guys, Scotty here. Uh, it's a windy, rainy day up here in Northern Ontario and it's a perfect day to be playing in a wood shop. Um, this winter, with COVID and all the craziness going with it, I've had an awful lot of time to read a whole lot of old bee books. Something I've enjoyed for a few years actually. Um, I might talk a little bit more about these old books later. I've actually been taking PDF files, which you can download all over the place on the internet, and I convert them to EPUB so that you can read them on a little e-reader a little easier. Um, nice to take with you when your wife goes shopping. You can sit in the car and read an old bee book. Anyway, this winter, I don't know how many I got through, but quite a few. And one of them was by a fellow by the name of Thomas Nutt. I believe the book was printed around 1830. He was from Great Britain. Um, interesting fellow, interesting book. Uh, at his time, there were still an awful lot of people who kept bees and uh, skeps, like a straw thing of some sort. And to get the honey and the wax out of it, sadly, they would create a little pit and a little tiny fire, and I guess to wait till they just had coals, and they would throw sulfur in there and then set the hive over it. Killed all the bees, sadly, and that's how they got the honey and the wax. And he was very opposed to this, so I kind of like him for that. Um, he came up with a hive. Uh, I'll put a picture of this in the video right now. It's called a collateral hive. Um, you see that piece up in the center in the top, little dome, there was actually a glass bell underneath there and, and the bees would get honey up in there. In the central compartment where there's that letter A, that's where the bees were. And then on either side, um, the bees could also get into there and put honey in there. He had thermometers in this thing, thermometers in this thing, and he had little doors that he could open and close and let the bees move to different sections. Uh, he would let the bees get up into that center section and like I say, it was a glass bell underneath that cover. And when they would fill that with honey, he would tip it up and use a wire to cut it off. It's quite interesting reading this book, how he did it. And he, he, he claimed that the temperature was the key to keeping the queen in the center. He would keep the two outside compartments cooler and he said that the bees um, the queen wouldn't go into that area. Of course, I don't think they had queen excluders yet at that time. That comes later. Of course, there's no removable frames yet. This is 1830 in Thomas Nutt's time. There was no removable frame. He does talk about starter strips in there, so they must have, must have been something similar to like a top bar hive or something or other. But because the sides were straight, I'm sure the bees attached the wax to the side. So, um, you know, these beehives were an evolution. Anyway, his, and you can see from that photograph, beautiful piece of furniture, really. I am not building anything that fancy. I'm not that good a woodworker. Um, but I have an idea. I have an idea. Um, this is a floor. This is a floor that I made for that double queen colony that I got going out there, that the honey supers get stacked up the center more as a method of controlling or trying to control Varroa. I'm going to work with this a little bit, of course. I'm going to end up making it bigger. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I'll stack up some boxes here in a second and show you. Ah, I wanted to just for a second though touch on something. I had a video I posted quite a while back. It might have been actually this video. I'm not sure. And somebody had said to me, why am I trying to re reinvent the perfect hive? The hive that's been perfected over, you know, 100 years since, since Landstroth. And well, the hives we use today, I have another photograph here. I'll, I'll include that right, right about now. That's an original, or near as I can figure, an original Landstroth hive. Very different than what we use today. Um, has it been perfected? Well, for some people perhaps it has. This is a commercial available box here, uh, which you know t almost everybody uses. Uh, I have from a manufacturer's point of view, without having handles, I don't have one of my boxes handy. You see, I put handles on the outside. I can see this with these little notches being way more convenient and cheaper for the manufacturer of these boxes to produce. So from their point of view, it's better than one with a handle. It would cost more money to make with a handle. For a commercial beekeeper, sure, I get it. You know, they want to put four hives on a pallet, umpteen dozen pallets on a transport. For them, I get it. 
Um, and unfortunately, as us backyard beekeepers, most, if not all of the manufacturers are going to cater to the commercial beekeeper because they're buying thousands, hundreds of thousands of boxes. I have no idea. Us backyard people are of no importance to, or very little importance. So we get what they want. Is it perfect? For them, perhaps. For me, not a chance. This box is full of honey. Uh, you, uh, you got a hundred pounds on the tips of your fingers. No, thank you. I like my handles. Um, with this setup, I read this book a couple times where he was describing this hive. And like I said, I'll stack some boxes up here in the center. If it works, there are some serious advantages, advantages to this. For a commercial beekeeper or anybody that's moving hives, not a chance in hell. This is not going to be a very movable hive, that's for sure. Should I do it? I don't know. Ontario's in lockdown again up here. Uh, there's not a heck of a lot to do, so I've got a little stack of pine sitting back here. Um, let me stack up some boxes, and I'll show you what I'm thinking. Give me a, give me a minute. All right, so this is kind of what I am thinking. I have two 10-frame uh, deeps uh, running the standard way that I run them, so quarter turn. So the frames, the frames are this way, not this way. Then I've actually got six honey supers, medium, stacked up with the frames running the opposite way. Then I've got three inner covers, separate inner covers, standard inner co my standard inner covers, and then ventilation boxes. Now, there's no floor, of course. The floor is the main thing that I, I need to build here. And I'm trying to build this whole setup with not making a whole bunch of um, pieces that are unique. The boxes are the same, the inner covers, the ventilation. Now I'm going to have to build a roof that covers this, and of course there's a little little dog leg here coming in, but that, that shouldn't matter. Uh, the roof was going to come down and cover this and go across, but as long as these are all the same height, uh, that's going to be fine. Um, this ventilation box is slightly shorter than these, and they're not quite perfect yet. I can, I can adjust them. These ventilation boxes are made this height just because the lumber that I buy is 11 and a quarter, and I've made a few different heights over the years, but the last few batches I've made, I just make them the full 11 and a quarter. The whole idea is that I can, I can put a, a feeder jar inside here, and I've got, I don't know, two or three inches to play with. So I can very easily adjust these so that the roof fits flat, and I'll just have to mark them, you know, center vent box for the Thomas Nut Hive, right, left, whatever. I'm not too worried about that. I can leave the inner covers the same. <sighs> Yeah, I can leave the inner covers the same. I can use my standard boxes. So, and now the idea with the floor is there's going to be a landing board there. The bees can head in here, and then they can come up into the two deeps. But in this floor, I'm going to have to build passageways that allows them to get into them. And that's, that's what he talked about in, uh, in this hive. There was some brass or something or other gate valve things that he had made. So I got to figure that out. <laughs> if you haven't figured out, I don't have blueprints. I don't have plans. I have a drawing and I am very much just making this up as I go, which is what I always do. It's no big deal. Um, so one of the advantages to this, if it works, if the bees will go into those honey supers, I don't pull honey off midsummer extract and then two, three weeks later do it again because I don't want to mess up my extractor and then either A, leave it sit with honey in it for two, three weeks till I extract again or clean it. I, I prefer to take all my honey off and extract it all in one shot. If I've got, you know, so I mean, if you had two or three honey supers on here and they filled it, sure, you could pull one off, extract it, put it back. But I don't do that. I end up with five four or five, I don't think I've ever had six, but I, I for sure have had five honey supers. It gets very tall. That's a problem. Uh, won't be such a problem now that I'm in the new bee yard and the hive is sitting on those concrete slabs, but it used to be an issue on the pallets. You'd see them starting to tip under the weight. That was a problem. Um, again, maybe it wasn't the perfect hive, right? <laughs> um, if, you, if, if for some reason, when, when those are all stacked up and you want to do a brood inspection, you got to tear it all down. That sucks. I've done it. No fun. If I can get the bees to go into these two stack ups on the side, I should be able to take the roof off, take out that ventilation box, 
I should be able to get this inner cover out of here. And now I can access my brood frames and I haven't touched my honey supers. Uh, I don't know, I don't know if this needs to be tight. I may actually be able to build this so that there's a, a small gap there. As long as, as long as this passageways that goes across, the bees don't end up in between here and robber bees getting in and out of there, I might be able to do that. I think I'm going to try and build it with it snug. Uh, there's so many things I could do. If I do move it out an inch or two, I could always build something that closes that gap. It's going to get complicated, I'm sure. Anyway, this is kind of where I'm going. I'm going to build that style of floor, except bigger, a landing board in the front. Like I say, I can, let, you know, when it's all propolized together, that's, that's going to be the issue. There's no doubt about that. Um, but, I don't know how, let me get a hive tool. If this is propolized together, I normally come in, I normally come in on a corner like that. But I think, yeah. I can probably come, I can probably come straight in and, and pry that up. Um, only really one way to find out, guys. Build it, play with it, try it. <laughs> Worst case scenario, throw it in a bonfire. Try again. Um, I may need a few more cups of coffee to work out all the details, but I, I think, true to my normal design process, I'm just going to start cutting wood, make sawdust, and play. So, I'm going to shut these cameras off, crank up my tunes. I'll bring you back when I've got something cool to show you. Possibly. Stay tuned! Hey guys, Scotty here. Uh, obviously, it's been a couple of days, probably about a week, maybe a little bit better than a week. Uh, it's April 18th today. Uh, I don't remember when I started this, but anyway, this is what I've kind of come up with. Um, I didn't shoot any video of actually assembling this because it became obvious very quickly that if your boxes aren't the exact same size as mine, the measurements I've used are not going to be of much use or importance. Also, I have no idea whether this is going to work or not, so I thought, well, if it works, probably next winter I'll do a video of exactly the dimensions and, of course, any modifications that I make. Um, when I was started this a couple weeks ago, I had talked a little bit about, I didn't know if I wanted a gap between the two brood boxes and the two stack ups of the honey supers. And as I was playing with it, um, I realized it won't be that difficult to change. I have built it so that there is no gap, but, um, the pieces that are on top of the wire, um, I didn't glue them down. They're all just screwed down. And this piece here is an inch and a half. And I don't know if the camera will see it. I created passageways under both these, so the bees will be able to come in. Nice landing board in the front, they can come in. They can come up into the two honey supers, but then they can go either way. I didn't bother making little doors. Uh, if I decide I want to plug that, well, I can remove the three honey supers easy enough, and I can block it. But uh, I have left it open. But anyway, if I decide I want a little wee bit of a gap, it'll be easy enough to add a piece of three quarter inch pine to the outside on both ends, take this off. This is made an inch and a half wide. I'll just make uh, two new ones that are three quarters of an inch wider. Then when I have my two, two brood boxes here, I can stack up the honey supers and I'll actually end up with a three quarter inch gap. Um, I don't worry about, well, this is closed, so the, the robber bees won't be able to get down into there because the two boxes are sitting on here rain gets in there, it'll certainly get in, but it's just going to go through the wire and end up, end up down below. And of course, I've got clean outs. I can put grease on that to check for varroa mites. Then what I did, I've got the screen on the outside on both ends. There's three holes here. And of course, they're drilled in an upward angle. And then, I don't know if that camera will catch it. There's three holes there that come into the center. Same thing on this side. And I can... I created some slides in here. Uh, I don't think I have an extra one. Maybe I'll try and get a close-up of that. So hopefully you can see in here. Um, so this is this section here would be where the honey supers are, and in behind here, um, that goes in. That goes in there to the uh, to the brood chamber, and there's screen on the on the opposite side there. So if I do end up with with bumblebees or wafts or whatever. It won't matter. There's number eight hardware cloth across the whole thing. So anyways, a slider there. There's a slider on the opposite side over there. And then in the, 
on the opposite side, it's the same thing. There's sliders. There's sliders in there. I don't know if I, yeah, you can see that. So I can hopefully I can regulate the temperature a little bit. And then, like I said, I can put grease on here to, to try and catch uh, try and catch varroa mites. All right. So around the back, I got the three three cleanouts. Uh, if if I feel that I need more ventilation, I actually actually easily add more ventilation to the to the front section on either side. I, well, it'll be a little tricky to put it underneath there. Uh, let me stack this up and I'll show you what it's going to look like. All right, so that's what it's going to look like. Uh, I've got to put the roof on there yet. Created two separate hive reducers. I got one with a, a very small hole that I can just attach with a couple screws. And then I've made another one. Just got a slightly, it's about the same height. I'm trying to keep the mice out, but it's about four or five inches wide. And of course, I could run it. That's three quarters by the, the whole width. Uh, behind there. I also made up three of these little wooden jig things here to, to hold three thermometers. So I can take this and just sit it directly above the, the vent in each one so I can monitor the temperature and then uh, I play with those little valves down at the bottom. I'm still going to have to, this is about a quarter inch, a quarter inch shy, so i got two choices. I can lower, I could lower these two or I'll just put a little wee shim on top of this. Either way, I'm not sure. Then I made a roof and I decided to add, <laughs> it's not actually that heavy. It's just a piece of half inch plywood with the five eighths and I put aluminum cover on it. I decided to add, add two handles. I can reach to the two outside edges and grab it, but it's a whole lot easier with just a couple of handles. I, say, I could, I can pick it up that way, but that's easy, much, much easier to take it off. The other thing I did with this I made it a little bit longer. Um, once that center vent box is the same height, that plywood comes down, sits on the top of all three vent boxes. There's, the insects aren't going to get in there. I've got about, oh, I don't know. I can just get my finger, when I, when I space it equally, my fingers just barely fit the front and the back. But on the ends, I've actually added, well, I added, I think, two extra inches. So if I decide to, Lengthen that floor by three quarter of an inch and leave a gap, leave a gap between the brood boxes and the honey boxes. I don't have to build a different roof. <sighs> it's a crazy thing, but I do like playing. Uh, I think I'm going to shoot a separate video of actually putting this out in the bee yard and playing with it, but it's going to be a couple weeks yet. I just ran in the house and uh, had a look at my 14 day forecast. Uh, I shot a couple videos earlier, the first pollen coming in, uh, whatever it was. I had a, the end of March, beginning of April was unseasonably warm here. Um, and I'm quite pleased we got it. Snow melted this year earlier than I've ever seen it melt. Uh, but the weather's kind of returned back to seasonal or normal. Um, they're still hitting, today's probably about, I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't look. It's not that warm. Sun's out. Um, the bees are collecting pollen from that pail, the tag alder, and I noticed yesterday, uh, there's one maple tree I walk by all the time, and I noticed the bees in the maple tree, and I looked at two or three others, and they're not open, but that one's in a quite a sheltered spot, so they're, they're just starting to bring in some maple pollen, uh, but looking at the 14-day forecast, uh, my overnight temperatures range from minus 4 to plus 4 Celsius, I'll figure out the Fahrenheit thing, and my daytime highs... I've actually got a couple of minus ones and then fives and sixes. Two weeks, at the very end of the two week forecast, forecast, my daytime highs are hitting nine and 10. So two, probably three weeks. I haven't unwrapped anything, haven't reversed any boxes, haven't brought down the nukes. Um, like I say, it's, it's gonna be early May and that's, that, that's when I think I did it last year. So I can put a little bit more paint on the handles. I got a couple more things that need just a little more paint. I don't know. Think I'll bother painting those, but I might. And then uh, when I'm reversing boxes, we'll get this thing out there and put some bees in it and see what kind of craziness we can get going from that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Appreciate your time. You guys be good to your bees, and I'm sure be good to you. We'll see you soon.